Hello, my name is Bob Tribe, and welcome to Valley to Vietnam. I will be your host today. Valley to Vietnam is a joint effort between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter uh, 500. It is our intent to trace the arc of experience between Sacramento and Vietnam for our local Vietnam era veterans. Um, today, our guest is John Rochelle, and John uh, served with the 4th Infantry, uh, did one tour in, in Vietnam in 1968 and into 1969. Thanks for your service, John. Well, thank you for having well, me. I'm glad to have you. Um, I should mention at the start of this that John has put together a wonderful collection of YouTube videos uh, that can be reached uh, by just simply putting in J. Dumas Rochelle. Oh. Yes. Uh, and that's uh, J. D. U. M. A. S. R. O. C. H. E. L. L. E. So, John, you were born where? Norfolk, Virginia. Ah, Southern boy. And I understand you were the youngest of four children. Yes, I was. And that, like many of those of us who were in the service in the 60s, our, our fathers were also in the service, generally in World War II, and your father served in World War II. Yes, my father was a combat engineer in the European campaign, and when he returned home in 1945, he worked for a short time at the Naval Shipyards, and then enlisted in the United States Air Force in the early, I think, 1950. Right, and then he was in for many years. He was in the Air Force for about 27 years. Wow. Um, one of the really interesting things uh, about John is that he, like several of my friends, were military brats, as they called them, and lived in many, many different places over the years uh, because of their father's service. So do you want to talk just a little bit about some of the places that you lived while you were growing up? Well, I always considered it fortunate to be what we call a brat. And I remember as a very young man being stationed, my father was stationed, I believe, first at uh, Savannah, Georgia. And we went from Savannah, Georgia to Orlando, Florida, to Burbank, California, to West Palm Beach, Florida, to Dover, Delaware, to Edwards Air Force Base, California. And then overseas. To, to Casablanca, Morocco, and New Asura Air Force Base. Wow. Then moved to Wiesbaden, Germany, and then returned to Charleston Air Force Base, 1963. Had a short stint at Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas, and then finally back to Charleston, which was when I departed and enlisted in the Army from Charleston. Must have been hard to hold on to friends moving so much. I think that's a, that's a curious question because one of the things that I realized and found through the years that the friendships that you do nurture as a brat are usually very long lasting and deep. Even though you may be with people for a short period of time, you connect in a way that I think too often civilian kids don't realize. Right. So you're connecting with other military kids who are bouncing all around too and you may you may see them at one Air Force Base and then later on down the road see them again. Yes, and that happened several times. Okay, great. Um, you started college at uh, Auburn University in Alabama. Um, you were recruited on a golf scholarship. Yes, in the summer of 66 I was recruited to go play at Auburn uh, for that, and go to school during that summer and to see if perhaps I would have merit to to obtain a scholarship, and as things happen, it didn't work out. Ah. So it was about that time that the war is really starting to go in 66, and you enlist. Yes, I, as, as my, my video uh, states, uh, I, I enlisted because I needed a job. <laughs> and you, you thought about the Air Force, though, before the Army. I did. I took the, my father being in the Air Force and me growing up in the Air Force environment, uh, I, I knew it was a, a, a great environment. And I took their test and, and scored rather well. But the one thing that was the determining factor for me was that in the Army they offered you an opportunity to become a commissioned officer. And no one in my family that I am aware of 
ancestrally had ever been an officer. They'd always been enlisted people. And that goes back, you'd mentioned, to your great-great-grandfather who was in the Confederate Army yes. out of North Carolina during the Civil War. Yes, he was a private. And so ever since then, you've had somebody in the service every generation. Yes, I have. Yes. Wow. Um, you go into the Army and uh, you go to basic training where? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I know that place well. <laughs> um, and then from Jackson, you go to advanced training where? For uh, advanced infantry training, Fort Ord, California. Clear across the country. They're, they're wasting a lot of tax dollars here with your transportation costs, I think. But you know. Well, what I found out was that I believe that was kind of where they corralled all the uh, enlisted people that would be potentially going on to uh, officer candidate school. Oh, okay. And from that, uh, uh, H22 is the unit I was with, uh, most of, almost the whole uh, company was uh, OCS candidates. Okay. And once you finish AIT, then you're going to go into officer candidate school. It's ordinance OCS, and it was my first choice. Okay. And, and how does that, I know it, when I went in, we had three choices, infantry, armored, or artillery. And how would that OCS differ, for instance, from infantry? Well, I, the, one of the things that with the ordinance, uh, at that time, because of the escalation of the war, typically, like you mentioned, I think there were three OCSs typically available, artillery, armor, and infantry. Mm -hmm. With the war expanding, they opened up seven of them. They opened up Signal Corps, they opened up Ordnance, Quartermaster, Engineers. So you had to, you had your, your opportunity to choose which one you might uh, prefer to go to. And quite frankly, I, I wasn't really into the infantry too much. Um, it's hard on the feet. It, uh, right. <laughs> uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to see if I could find something that uh, uh, could even maybe assist me in civilian life. So I thought Ordnance might be an interesting uh, alternative. Uh, to um, you know anything else now as you probably know you you, you had to choose one combat arms they, they gave you three choices when you you ask and and uh, two of my first two were non-combat arms and my third was combat engineers uh, and since i got the first one it was uh, academic but what right. the other two were and it was really the time time in the army where they they needed not only infantry people but they needed people in every branch of the service and so in fact, in a lot of cases, a lot more in support branches than in the infantry. So, um, so what do you think about OCS? I mean, it's still near and dear to my heart. And um, well, ordinance OCS I thought was pretty interesting from the concept that the TAC officers, the, those are the officers that trained you. You know, when you're enlisted man, you have sergeants. They call DIs, drill instructors. To, to train you in, in officer candidate school, you had officers. Right. And our officers were always armor. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they felt that connection of armor to uh, ordnance, uh, since repairing tanks and track and stuff like that was was uh, important. Uh, our particular OCS, and and you, and you talk about all the other ones. As I recall, uh, we had to run everywhere we went once we left the billet for 18 weeks. And I think that was the only OCS that did that. The other ones, I believe, could begin to walk after like 12 weeks. After they became intermediate status, I think right. they said they classified it. And ordinance, for whatever reason, and maybe it was because they wanted to give some type of toughness to it, right. you know, to, to that. Uh, but uh, So I, I found that was um, uh, interesting that we had to do that. The other thing, I, 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 the way I endured OCS, because I was only 18 and a half, was no matter how difficult it was going to be or how much they harassed me, and believe me, they still did the harassment, I pretty much knew they weren't going to kill me. <laughs> right. You know, that's pretty safe to say. There we go. So that it, th Sometimes they would get close to it, but, you know. <laughs> um, so you finished OCS, and you were then, you did some additional schooling, I think, before you went to Vietnam. 
you get a, an MOS of 4815 uh -huh. when you graduate from ordinance, which is a maintenance officer. The other field uh, in, in the ordinance uh, core is uh, supply. And so I went to a uh, supply management officer school, school at Fort Lee, Virginia, that's in Petersburg, to get a MOS for 4201, which is supply management officer. Uh huh. And then once you'd finished this school, you went back to Fort Jackson where you had a, your first sort of officer's assignment. Yeah, I think, you know, when you request your assignment, I, I think someone was startled when they, when they said that, uh, or when they saw that I requested Fort Jackson, because it was like, really? Why would anyone want to go to Fort Jackson? Well, they didn't know that uh, my, my parents uh, in my high school years were being, uh, I grew up in Charleston, which is only 100 miles away, so Fort Jackson was yeah. ideal for me, so nice. that on the weekends I could go back to, the, to Charleston. Oh, great. So now you eventually, after having these assignments, um, typically they want you to have six months time here in the States before they send you over, um, minimum, I guess. Um, but you went to Vietnam August 15, 1968. Yes. And you're, you're headed for where? Well, the order said 4th Infantry Division, play coup Vietnam. Uh huh. And. Uh, that's where I ended up. Okay, and this is Camp Anari. Camp Anari. Okay. It was the base camp. Yeah. And you're not initially doing much related to ordinance. You get this new assignment uh, that uh, maybe you're just lucky, but tell us about that. Well, I, I was assigned to the 704th Maintenance Battalion. And so I went to the uh, report to the uh, uh, commander, the battalion commander, Lieutenant Ball, or Lieutenant Colonel Ball, excuse me. And we talked about my MOSs and what I might be doing and things like that. And the next thing he says, well, we're going to let you be the battalion patrol leader. And I remember asking Colonel Ball, I said, sir, patrol leader? He goes, yes, you're going to be the patrol leader, yet you'll lead a 10-man patrol that will reconnoiter the area around base camp for about, you know, five to ten clicks and make sure things stay secure. And I remember saying to the colonel, well, sir, I sure appreciate that, but this here on my collar is a, is a bomb, not cross rifle. <laughs> yeah. And he looked at me sternly and said, son, the first mission of every armor officer is infantry. Oh. Well, that was interesting, and I, you know, I, I noticed you have some nice film of that uh, in your YouTubes of you being out on patrol with your, basically you had a 10-man team plus 10 infantry guys plus a medic and you, and... Um, well, let me correct you. The, the patrol members were not infantry. Oh, they were ordnance guys. They, they were... But, but their primary mission. <laughs> right, They're, but they were all volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they, but they had different MOSs. And, and the, your, the pictures we refer to that other vets will remember this, we, we carried those Kodak Instamatic cameras that had the cartridges. Uh -huh. So it was really easy to just throw a cartridge in there and they were pretty, for the most part, waterproof and things like that. Right. So we were snapping pictures all the time. Nice. Um, you were telling me a little story earlier about being out there when uh, the monsoon, monsoon season hit and becoming hypothermic, you were amazed how cold it got up in the highlands uh, at night. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, for those that did serve in the Central Highlands, they'll remember that, and you don't really always think about this, and I'm not sure anybody actually prepared me for it, but when I was out on patrol, and this was in uh, October, September and October of 68, you'd get a, a, a monsoon rain that would come in around four o'clock in the afternoon and you know maybe only last for a half hour, 45 minutes. But when you're out there in the field, uh, there's no place to go for cover. So you know you might take your pinch launder out and try to cover up, but for the most part, you're gonna get soaked. Right. By the time it quits and then the sun sets, now it's starting to cool up 
and you're 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 soaking wet, and the winds are coming up, and then I actually physically started chattering. My teeth were chattering, and I was like, "Man, this is this is a little strange." So, what well, I saw all of a sudden the other guys do, and the more experienced guys is we started taking our jungles off, hanging them over the bushes, so they dry off. But we're standing around basically nude <laughs> until these uh, uniforms can dry off, and then of course as you're skin gets dried off and then you get warmed up warmer but it, it was really bizarre to me because I never thought about that wearing your helmets and your m16s so that's about that's it. about it yeah. and a smile all right <laughs> well you know I never really thought about that but okay so next um, you go from play coup to bend me to it east uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what you were doing there well when my patrol time was up uh, the uh, I actually got orders to first go to Doc To. Uh, the the fourth division was broken into three brigades, uh -huh. and uh, as I recall, I think it was the third brigade that was up in Doc To, and the second brigade was in Bami to it, and I think the first brigade was on K. But uh, I had first got orders to go to Doc To, and then they switched and they sent me to Bami to it East, which was a uh, temporary fire base for the brigade. Uh, there had been a, 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 an increased uh, enemy activity from the North Vietnamese. Uh, most of the engagements of the 4th Division were involved with uh, NVA regulars as opposed to Viet Cong guerrillas. Right. And so they had set up a, a um, uh, fire base there and, and they needed uh, a replacement for a lieutenant that uh, was going home in, in, in tech supply. So part of my MOS qualified me to do that job, so I went down there as a platoon leader and as a tech supply officer. Okay. Um, you mentioned that at Bammy to it was one of Teddy Roosevelt's old hunting lodges. I never knew he was in Vietnam. Teddy Roosevelt, yeah, did tiger hunting from what I understand oh in, in Vietnam. Uh, and as a lot of the vets will identify with, you know, when you're out on a fire base, you, you, you need to learn real quick where to, to get stuff. Because you, you're typically not going to get it through the normal channels of supply, but usually around every, every fire base is going to be some special forces camp or whatever. And the special forces had set up their, their uh, camp there at uh, what was called the Grand Bungalow, uh, which is, uh, was in Bami to it. And they had a PX and things like that. So you, you found out right away where you had to go to, to go get stuff. And so that's how I stumbled across stuff and found out the history of that being Teddy Roosevelt's hunting lodge. Wow. Interesting. Um, and then you were doing, running uh, contact teams, um, two or three men ordnance units going out and fixing weapons and artillery and all that sort of thing. So. Yeah, contacts teams was it, it actually to me is a, a thing that's probably not given enough recognition. When you when you have a, a support uh, a company like uh, I was uh, on a fire base, and then you had the forward units, the line company guys that were out there, uh, you, they always were having some type of uh, malfunction with either mortars or artillery uh, scopes or all of these different little things and. And it was more prudent to send someone out there to try to repair rather than to try to send a Chinook or something to bring back an artillery piece right. or something like that. So contact teams would go out on an as-need basis uh, to uh, repair these, these uh, the equipment that uh, malfunctioned. And they would typically go out for uh, one, two, or three days and living under the same conditions and the, the same uh, risk that the infantry guy were. Getting mortared and getting artillery and... Yeah, and, and, it's, and, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's uh, one of those things that you, first of all, you, you have a heck of a lot of appreciation for the infantry guys. Right. You, you later became the assistant battalion S2, S3, so that's intelligence and operations officer. Um, and you saw that you could probably get a 90-day early out if you were accepted back at the university. So you applied for that? Yes, actually I applied for that, <clears throat> I, I think it was probably November or December uh, of 68. A lot of the uh, middle class mothers complaining 
that uh, the elite classes uh, kids didn't have to go to Vietnam because they were all in college. Right. And so because of that, uh, they wanted to say, well, you know what, we're going to let anybody that has an opportunity to go to college to benefit from it. So that is how I understood the program came about. I, I have to be candid with you. I, I, I knew right off the bat that uh, Vietnam War, uh, Army, uh, the military life uh, was not going to be uh, my calling. And so when I saw this opportunity, uh, I applied for it and, and did get accepted back into Auburn. And I would say the, the detriment was that sometimes uh, you might be viewed as not being a team player when you wanted to shorten your tour. And that's just one of those things I kind of had to accept. It sounded like a smart move to me. Um, you know, one thing, you told me a few stories about you became sort of a master scrounger there. And it reminded me of, you know, one of the characters in The Great Escape. I forget which actor played that person, but it was always coming up with things. Uh, it might have been James Garner. Yes, um, it was. But why don't you tell us some of the things you were doing there? Well, the, the practical aspect of the Army, and, and once again, most of these vet, our veterans watching will know this, is that you typically can't get anything through normal channels. You need to learn to will and deal. It's kind of like I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. So, for instance, uh, when we would move into LZ Mary Lou there in Contum, it was just completely dust. I mean, it, the, everywhere you walk, dust, dust, dust. So I would find an engineer unit that might be close by and say, do you have any of this stuff called Petaprime? And it was like an oil-based uh, mixture that uh, they would uh, uh, um, spread over the roads to keep the dust down. Uh -huh. And so the guy goes, yeah, we can get a load over to your company area. How many Jeep tires do you have? You know, and that kind of stuff. Or, or you know, what, what do I have that maybe they could use? And so you did a lot of trading like that. I, I would trade uh, with the special forces camps to get uh, movies, the uh, uh, 60 millimeter movies that were so hard to get for us. They, they weren't hard for guys in base camp, but right. uh, in, the, in the field they were a little bit tough. And so I was always trading something with them. I think that's a good trivia question you told what was the number one movie that everyone wanted to see? Well, this is, by the way, my opinion, and the one that it was hardest to get, and I finally got after about three months, was The Graduate. Great movie. That, that was yeah. just the in, in that was the Introduced Dustin one. Hoffman to the world. Yeah, when I finally got that movie from that Special Forces camp, uh, it was the first sergeant that helped me do that, uh, I had it going, showing for like two or three days straight, <laughs> constantly running and let my troops come into the bunker to watch it and stuff like that. Oh, it nice. was really a great thrill. Um, okay, so eventually you're going to head home, and you uh, head home, what, in May of 69 to Fort Lewis, Washington, and from there what happened? Well, right, my, my uh, d Rose was May 22nd uh, and flew out of Cameron Bay and then flew into, uh, we, you know, there's a stop in Japan, I think at Yakima Air Force Base, and then you go to Fort Lewis. And that's where I separated. And uh, from uh, there I went straight to Auburn University. It was within two weeks I was in, in college. And uh, then I just, uh, you know, started to uh, reflect on uh, what, what I wanted to do. and. I uh, was always proud to serve, but I, at that time, would have to confess that I, I probably was not a, a big supporter of our involvement in Vietnam. Right. And you just go, you went semester, you went right through the summers and just did one semester or one quarter or whatever after another with no break at all, and then finally you just decide, you yeah, know, there's got to be something else in life for me than what I'm studying. and. I'm doing. Well, you know, my story is I, I, when I got back, uh, I, I went from, from summer of 69 through uh, uh, fall of 70, and, and, and rather than taking 15, 16 hours, I was taking 21. I was trying to graduate in three years. Whoa. And, but, but I was also becoming somewhat disenchanted with, uh, uh, you know, maybe the American dream. So on a kind of a whim, I decided I was going to hitchhike to California. Got out here uh, in the late December of 70 and then met a girl and never went back. I mean, it wasn't like anything was planned. It just kind of happened. And so you got to Sacramento in December of 70? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then you end up in the automotive business. Yes. I. Uh, it's kind of funny. I found out uh, my, my major in college was political science. Uh-huh. 
And I honestly wanted to maybe get involved in politics, uh, maybe become a lawyer. Uh, I wanted to uh, be a public servant. Mm -hmm. uh, what I found is that when I made any inquiries to, to apply for a job at the legislature, anything of that, that nature, it didn't seem to care that I was a Vietnam vet. It didn't seem to matter I was an officer. It didn't seem to matter anything other than I think you got to have connections. Right. So being married now and having a responsibility of a wife, I, I had to find a job and it was tough. And it was tough finding jobs. And I had let my hair grow a little bit long so some people didn't want to hire you because of that. Finally, when I got desperate, I saw an ad for selling cars and it said no experience necessary. And I remember back in college that some of those college girls I dated used to say to me, John, you're such a silver tongue, you should be selling cars. <laughs> so I said, maybe this is for me. And anyway, I started doing that and I, I did pretty well and yeah, I did it for years. And you were still in your 20s when you became a general sales manager for a big, big new car outfit and uh, yep 29 years old yeah and you decided to go back to school though and you went to law school yes and so now that's I assume how you how you uh, support yourself is through yeah, I, your practice my, my my wholesale car company that e evolved eventually uh, was relatively successful and, and so I, financially I, was, I did all right in my life but I, I felt I was missing something so I wanted I guess maybe some more challenges so mm -hmm. I I knew I had had always the dream of going to law school so I applied and was accepted and then went to uh, night school for four years Lincoln Law School it's an excellent law school okay well great John and you live in Carmichael now and um, have a lovely home I've been there um, I'd just like to again um, recommend uh, John's uh, YouTube videos. They're they're really very well done. Spent seven years working on those, uh, and so they're they're gems. Um, so this concludes our time on Valley to Vietnam. I'd like to thank John Rochelle um, and say welcome home to him and to all our veterans. For Valley to Vietnam producer Jerry Ward, director James Scott, and researcher Christy Dentry, um, I'm Bob Tribe, and I'm saying farewell, and I hope you join us next time on this program. And thank you, John. Thank you, Fred. Thank you.